Hey guys, Randing Spider-Man here, and time for another video game review. Without a doubt, one of my favorite video game franchises has to be the Fire Emblem series. Like many people outside Japan, I first started the series in 2003 with Fire Emblem The Blazing Sword and was hooked right away. I played and enjoyed all of the Western releases. Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn is one of my favorite games of all time and to me was the peak of the series. But the Fire Emblem series didn't really catch on here in North America. That was until 2013 when Fire Emblem Awakening came out and was an explosion of success saving the franchise from cancellation. And while I do like Fire Emblem Awakening fine enough, it did mark a departure from the classic series I was used to. I guess I was just surprised that it was such a big hit because I think it has the weakest story of any of the Fire Emblem games I have played. By no means a bad game, but it felt a bit more of an experiment than a dedicated Fire Emblem game. However, since the game saved the franchise from being discontinued, it has my respect. But then Fire Emblem Fates came out, and this one I was just flat out not a fan of. The story was better, but it suffered from characters being reduced to anime stereotypes, a terrible script, clumsy pacing, and painful, PAINFUL fan service. And then we have all the reused character designs from Awakening, or as I like to call them, Awakening, the greatest hits, and a bunch of gimmicky shit that to me took more out of this series than they did add to it. I don't think the Fates games are bad games, but there is something a bit disheartening to see the dignity sucked out of one of your favorite series in favor of a waifu simulator and an abundance of DLC. So I was worried that the series would continue this direction of fan service and absurdity. The new direction created the sort of divide within the fan base of people like myself who prefer the older style and people who prefer the new direction. But during a Nintendo Direct, we were introduced to the next game in the series, Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia. This game is actually a remake of the second Fire Emblem game, Fire Emblem Gaiden, which came out on the Famicom. But how did this game turn out? Did they keep it in the style of the old school Fire Emblem games? Did they make it more like Fates and Awakening? Or did they find a balance between each to keep both sides happy? Well, let's take a look at Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia. God, that title is long. The story of Echoes goes like this. In Ram Village, a young boy named Alm saves his closest friend Celica from being kidnapped by bandits. Because of this, and due to mysterious circumstances surrounding her, Celica is sent away from Ram Village, separating her and Alm. Several years go by without the two of them seeing each other. When a knight named Lucas comes to his village, Alm learns that the king has been overthrown and killed by one of his own generals who has also pledged loyalty to the enemy nation of Regel. Lucas has come looking to recruit Alm's grandfather Mycin in a liberation army called the Deliverance to take back the country of Zofia. When Mycin refuses to join, Alm and his friends volunteer to join the army in his place. Meanwhile, Celica realizes that the Earth Goddess Mila has gone missing due to the dying crops and sets off on a pilgrimage to investigate this disappearance. Neither Alm or Celica realize the importance of the journey they're each going to take and how their fates will be and have always been intertwined. That's the starting premise anyway, but like any Fire Emblem game, the story unravels into something much more by the end of it. The story feels very classic. It does offer a decent amount of twist along the way. I don't think it's a terribly original story by any means, and that's fine. It's a remake of a game that came out in the 80s, but it's one of those classic epics that never really gets old. It doesn't get new either, though. There's nothing in this story that's daring or revolutionary. It's just a good story. And you know what? That's fine enough. It's a bit of a return to form for the series, and I am totally cool with that. So I like the story. I also really dig the art design in this game. The general designs and colorings are very 80s. They are very reminiscent of old medieval animes where the characters dress in almost one single color. However, the line work and the added intricacy to the designs is very modern, creating this art style that looks old and new at the same time. I really like it. This is what I was missing from Fates and Awakening. These characters all look a million times more dignified and absolutely none of them are subjected to painful fan service. They are all treated with respect and class, and that is exactly what I wanted and what the series had given me for years. And unlike the last few games that used 3D cutscenes, this game uses 2D style animations that look straight out of an anime. It looks fucking awesome. I know some people prefer the 3D look, and I think I do too, 
but I don't think anyone can deny that the animation and the smoothness in these cutscenes look fantastic and they make me really crave a proper Fire Emblem anime. There are some shortcomings with the aesthetics though, I'm really not a fan of how the conversations look. I don't really like how Alm and Celica are at the bottom. It kind of takes away from the feeling of camaraderie I used to get seeing a bunch of characters next to each other interacting. This is a minor complaint obviously. This is also the first Fire Emblem game to be fully voice acted and it's... Uh, it's alright. There are times where the characters sound really flat and others where they sound pretty good. Alm's voice actor is kind of flat, but Berkut's voice actor... Lies, lies, lies! Oh my god. This guy is trying way too hard. I respect the fact that he gets into it and is willing to act out and shout his lines, but some of this shouting is unwarranted and a little over the top, but I'll give him a bit of a pass since I can appreciate the effort. The dialogue in this game is pure Fire Emblem. Lots of dignified speech and some old English really help the medieval feeling settle in. My sin. <laughs> Damn him and his blood. They may sing of him as a hero, but no one even knows what wench the man sprang from. One thing that took a real big hit in this aesthetic change was the combat window. It tells you all the same information, but in a less convenient way. Rather than just telling you how much damage you will do, it just shows you what chunks of the enemy's health will be missing if you hit. That's stupid and I hope they don't ever use this display again, or at least give us the option to use the classic combat window if we so desire. I'll go more into the combat in a second, but I just want to go over the style of this game, and I gotta say, I loved it. It's a return to form that I think will please both sides of the fanbase just fine. Now, let's get into the meat of this review, the gameplay. I'm not going to explain the combat system of the Fire Emblem series beat by beat, I'm just going to go over the changes. Keep in mind the original Fire Emblem Gaiden was a Famicom sequel, and much like Castlevania 2, Zelda 2, and the North American Super Mario Bros. 2, it's very different and it's sort of the black sheep within the series, so some of these changes are going to be a result of that. I haven't played the original so I can't tell you exactly what they kept and what they added, so I'll just be looking at the combat system as is. First of all, this game does away with the classic weapons triangle, which I feel is a shame. I always liked that rock paper scissors mechanic. It was a simple but effective extra layer of strategizing. It also completely removed axes in general, which I don't like. Granted, I didn't always use axe wielding units, but they served a totally legit purpose and added some variety in the physical weapons. What's also gone is your inventory. Each character can only hold one item and they will have a stock weapon in their possession if you equip them with something like a shield instead. I like the idea of being able to buff your characters with extra equipment, but not at the expense of your inventory. After replaying Radiant Dawn for the 100th time, I realized why they did this. I spent several minutes of game time just organizing items for each character, so the creators probably felt that this was too time consuming and tedious, so they did away with it for this much more basic version, but I feel like this did way more harm than good. Yeah, the older games had a lot of time consuming organizing to them, but I enjoyed that honestly. I loved going to each individual unit that I planned on using and thinking through what I wanted them to have. It was carefully thought out strategizing and it felt rewarding to see all that time you spent giving each unit the perfect weapons pay off. So I'm not really a fan of the inventory change. Dungeon exploring is a new feature and I love it. It's so freaking awesome to control Om and Celica in a fully 3D environment and I really like how the battles work here. When you collide with an enemy, it goes to a mini-map and turns into a traditional Fire Emblem game. If you manage to attack them, the enemy starts off with missing health. If they hit you from behind, they move first. It's a good balance and I think this idea works. I actually love level grinding in Fire Emblem games and this is a fun way of doing it. But... This leads into what I feel is the worst part of this game, the leveling system. I am really not a fan of this. So here's the thing, the higher the level you are, the less experience you get from killing enemies. Now, that's normal and fine, but the amount of experience you get from enemies when you're around level 10 is absolutely pitiful. You'll be lucky if you get 10 experience points. The drop off rate is so extreme, and you might be thinking that I need to kill stronger enemies, but no! Even killing stronger enemies, enemies that put my characters at risk of being killed, still only give them 10 experience. This level system sucks because it forces you to change character classes early, missing out on the other stat boost that you could have gotten. Gone is the idea of changing your character's class at level 20 when they are maxed out. 
Now you are essentially forced to change classes early, and when you change classes, killing an enemy at level 1 in your second class will grant you way more experience than level 15 of your first class. That sucks, and what sucks even more is that you don't get to choose when your characters can change classes. Some characters aren't eligible for a class change to level 14, and it is an absolute crawl to get there when you're only getting 10 experience points per enemy kill. Hell, at that point, it may be as low as 7 points, and it makes level grinding really tedious because there are a limited number of enemies in each dungeon, so you have to constantly leave the area and come back to make them respawn and re-engage them. But you can't even do this continuously because the dungeons have a fatigue system. This new mechanic where if the same character fights too many people in the dungeon, they will get tired and their health will drop to half, and you can't cure it until you either give them food or take them to a Mila statue to have everyone blessed. But the blessings don't last very long so expect to be going back and forth over and over again. It really is a painfully boring experience. I know why they did this though. Awakening's leveling system was really exploitable and made the game a complete joke in terms of difficulty. And Fates wasn't much better. Sacred Stones had a decent balance though. You could level as much as you wanted but you still couldn't change classes until you got the proper item which isn't available until later in the story thus preventing you from going overboard. Plus you had breakable weapons, so you had to make sure your inventory could afford the grinding session. Sacred Stones had a drop off point in the leveling too, but it was more balanced and almost every level on the tower or ruins still had at least one enemy unit who was an automatic level up to the person who killed it. That was still more balanced and less tedious than it is here. So yeah. I really don't like the leveling limitations in this game, or the fatigue system. On to the next part of the combat system. In this game, the magic users lose health when they cast certain spells. I'm okay with this change because it's really not as annoying as it sounds, and I guess if you wanted to introduce some type of fatigue system, this way makes sense. Unlike in Fates, when Ryoma could lose health because he swung his fucking sword, I don't know. Though, in this game, he'd probably miss. Yeah, I don't know why, but I missed a lot in this game, even when I had like a 90% chance of hitting. I don't know if it's just me, but I never had this problem with any other Fire Emblem game. One thing Echoes has done is find a decent balance for clerics. In the older Fire Emblem games, they were almost useless. They took way too long to level up, and they could only heal. You are always better off just giving a Sage a staff since they can cast magic too. Fates and Awakening did this a lot better by making the clerics gain more experience whenever they healed somebody. Echoes also has a solid balance. The clerics in this can attack and heal. The trade-off is that they are given the spell Nosferatu, which has low accuracy. I think that's balanced. You can't just make the clerics have standard attacks because then they would just be these overpowered units that can heal and deal damage whenever they want. Once you learn the new spells via leveling, that's when the clerics really shine because they get more accurate spells. That's another thing I forgot to mention. Some items teach skills to characters the more they use them. I like this. It's one of the few things in Final Fantasy IX I actually liked and they work really well here. The last thing I'll mention are the support conversations. They are the characters interacting with each other. Great, we're back to how it should be. Overall, I would have to say the combat system is okay, but it's struck down by the leveling process which is a major problem I feel. To be fair, I never really felt the game was too difficult or too easy. The difficulty is very well balanced. If that was the developer's goal in the end, then I guess it worked, but it's just a bit too tedious for my taste. Like Sacred Stones and Awakening, Echoes offers you an overworld map you can explore freely. This is the first Fire Emblem game where you can actually go into a town and interact with the villagers, which I think is awesome. Some of them provide some side quests that offer rewards, though I'll admit most of them are just bring me this stingy fetch quest, so it feels like a good idea that wasn't fully realized. I also don't really like how the villages are just a still shot that you can look around with the cursor. They really should have made these more like when you're exploring the dungeons. Plus the lack of shops kind of take the fun out of going to new villages, but I do enjoy hearing more of the game's lore and it helps flesh out the game world more. I also think it's cool to explore the country of Regal in the later part of the story, but that's kind of another problem. Regal has a history of being raised on strength rather than compassion, but the contrast between Regal and Zofia really isn't that different. I would have liked it if they actually fleshed out Regal as a nation and really used it to bring Zofia's morality into question. 
as it stands now, it's way too black and white. Regal is evil and Zofia is good. It's a missed opportunity to make two different countries that have radically different political and social beliefs, but could still be seen from a neutral point of view. The most we get is that some Zofians become lazy, greedy, and spoiled, but we never really see that firsthand, so we don't really know how Zofia could be the bad guys. Yeah, they have a couple of bad guys, but they all defect to Regal, so it doesn't really make a difference. When it comes to the level design, this is another problem. Almost every level in this game is the same damn thing. Over half of them are just open fields with each side charging at each other. Some of them are inside castles and those ones are a bit better, but still not great. This is actually one thing that I think Fates did better than most of the other games. Fates actually had really good level design. Fates actually made you sneak around a ninja tower and ride moving platforms and avoiding lava. It was a change of pace and that was cool. Another problem with the levels in Echoes is that every level has the same victory conditions. They are all either kill the boss or kill everyone. No more, no less. That's every level and it is a weakness. This is something Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn excelled at. You had a wide variety of mission objectives. Kill the boss, kill everyone, survive for 15 turns, hold the line for 10 turns, seize the throne, protect this unit, kill warning enemies. Some had multiple ways of winning like survive 15 turns or kill the boss. It added a new way to approach each level and made you consider your options before determining your course of action. In this game, you only have one course and it's murder everyone. Yay! Everything is murder! Everything is cool when somebody dies! Everything is murder! So the world of Echoes is probably the most open in the series in terms of freedom and exploration, but it just wasn't packed with enough content to make the exploring feel worth it or totally fulfilling. Nothing terrible, but nothing amazing. The music in this game is just fantastic, like all Fire Emblem games. This one really has an epic feel and all of the tunes are memorable. The opening title menu song is so quiet and haunting without it all feeling pretentious. It's just a woman harmonizing to the sound of a marching drum, simple but very effective. The classic Fire Emblem theme is here too, but it seems like it's the same one that was introduced in Super Smash Bros. Brawl and I don't really care for this version. I don't like the choir singing over the score. I do, however, love the overworld map theme. It just screams classic adventure. It's a really nostalgic track. There are also a lot of sad, depressing tracks, and they sound great. They carry the mood of this game perfectly. It's kind of hard to judge the music for a Fire Emblem game since I think all of them have had fantastic soundtracks, so there's not too much to say except enjoy the music. Right from the beginning, this game annoyed me with this opening that shows a major part of the climax. They did this in Awakening too, but in Awakening, it was an alternate future that was foreshadowing later events, so it was a bit understandable. Fates kind of did this too, but it really wasn't that bad there because it was basically just a trailer for the premise of the game that everyone knew. There is literally no reason for this fake out other than to be annoying, so fuck off with that shit. Another thing that is stupid is that Alm's second class promotion is in Celica's route. Minor complaint, I guess, but I was really not a fan of it. What I am a fan of is the twist that Alm is the heir to the Regalian throne and is the son of Emperor Rudolph. I love that twist and how it helps end the game. It is perfect and unexpected, but it makes sense. Alm and Selica each are good representatives of what Sophia and Regal should be. Alm is brave, calm, and leads with strength, whereas Selica is soft, compassionate, and leads with grace. Each offsets the other and both of them represent the differences and similarities between Duma and Mila perfectly. Getting back to stupid is how Rudolph lets Alm kill him and then tells him that he is his father. Why? Why not just stand down and tell your son who you are? The ultimate goal is to destroy Duma, so why make your own son kill you? It's just nonsensical. Another scene I liked was the scene where Berkut sacrificed his lover to Duma for more power. It's such a disturbing scene. It shows the chaos of what living a life consumed by lust for power and acceptance leads to. The last thing I'm going to talk about is Selica's decision to sacrifice herself to Duma to free Mila. 
I liked Celica a lot up until this point because this is stupid. Even if her sacrificing herself to Duma would save Mila, the man who told her this is Jetta, a man who looks like Satan's Tuffle Smurf, who is constantly trying to kill your friends and is always insulting you and laughing evilly. What kind of fucking idiot are you? How is she so surprised when it turns out he was lying the whole time about how to save Mila? What the fuck did you think was gonna happen, you stupid bitch? That's like asking Charles Manson to babysit your Jewish baby. It's not going to end well. So those are all the major spoilers I wanted to talk about. To wrap this review up, Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia is a return to the old school Fire Emblem games, but maybe a bit too old school in some regards. I think that some of the choices were based on the original Famicom version, but I'm just speculating. I appreciate the look and feel of the game, the classic story, and the wonderful cast of characters. It falls a bit short when it comes to the combat and leveling system, and since that's what you're going to be doing the most, it's a pretty big trade-off. I don't think those parts are bad though, I think they are okay. But like with any Fire Emblem game, I'm not really looking for okay. I'm looking for quality based on the series' impressive resume. I do think though that this is a fair enough balance between the old and new Fire Emblem series fans, and I hope it helps steer more new fans into appreciating the older vibe of the series. I also hope that it will push intelligent designs to make their next Fire Emblem game more like the games between Binding Blade and Radiant Dawn. And since the next Fire Emblem game is going to be the first home console game in 10 years, I want to see them push this series like it's never been pushed before. Though I did complain a lot throughout this review, it came from a place of passion. I am passionate about this series in every installment it gets. I did enjoy this game. I enjoyed it more than both Awakening and Fates. So time for the rating. I give Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia an 8 out of 10. It comes close, but it falls just a bit short of what I wanted. I would still recommend that everyone pick this game up. It's a really good game that's worth owning. It may not be perfect, but it's still Fire Emblem. That's it for this episode of Ranting Spider-Man. I will see you guys next time and thank you for watching.